Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm in there. Okay, welcome. We'll try to start more than some time. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Short, who makes his doctors about uh, fracking, about which he's been uh, inviting local groups, I guess, fighting against fracking, as far as I understand. So it might be a one-sided presentation. Certainly not. Well. Um, <laughs> otherwise, he's... Um, <laughs> He's a reader in human rights and the co-director of the Human Rights Consortium at the School of Advanced Studies uh, of the University of London. His uh, latest book is uh, Redefining Genocide, Settler, Settler Colonialism, Social Deaths and Ecocide. It's a very cheery book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure and I'm sure which is also directly related to what uh, he's to talk to us about. Um, otherwise he's editor in chief editor-in-chief of the Journal of Human Rights in the Commonwealth. He's worked with a variety of NGOs, both environmental and human rights. Um, and he's, he's published extensively in, I guess, various pe in indigenous people's rights, environment, human rights, all the things that eventually coalesce into <laughs> fracking. Uh, welcome and thank you for Thank you, Philippe. Coming. Cheers, thanks. Uh, how long have I got? Uh, Indefinite. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, it won't take that long. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so, what I'll talk about today is um, not genocide, um, but it's basically one of the other fields of um, research I've been working on, which is pretty much looking at the policing of environmental protests, in particular the anti-fracking protests. Um, some of it is actually covered in, in the book on genocide, but looking at it more from um, indigenous people's perspective. So um, it's come out of this initiative we set up a few years ago. And we're just literally over the road, so we're in the other part of Senate House, so not the SOAS, probably the other side. Um, and this extreme energy initiative we set up to look at the social and environmental harms um, that have come out of extreme energy production. I'll, I'll explain what we mean by that uh, in a few slides' time, but basically that's the sort of um, front-facing element of the of the research project. Um, the this particular work has stemmed from a, a chance meeting with some academics who were looking at protest policing um, in <coughs> Barton Moss, um, north of England, and my work on the social harm and this collective trauma, as we call it, has been experienced by some of the people um, opposing fracking in Lancashire. Um, and their study uh, was called Keep Moving, and that was the expression the police used um, to the protesters to stop them slow walking, okay? So they wanted to speed up one of their protests. So that was a, a something that protesters often hear the police saying. Um, this report is freely available. It was written by these three academics who I now work with. And the idea was that we wanted to bring their interests and my interests together and produce a national study, okay, to see whether there was any national picture to the policing strategy. Um, you can Google that, it's a fantastic report. Um, they really, really are excellent people. And I've studied more and more working with um, critical criminologists in this field. So um, the human rights side of my work and their uh, criminology sort of coming together to look at the status of the right to protest, okay, uh, and how it's been affected by the policing strategies. Um, so let's start then with looking at what happened post um, this rather infamous case of Ian Tomlinson's death in the G20 protests in London in 2009. So following that uh, high profile uh, unfortunate death, you had a shift in attitudes, okay, or in terms of the rhetoric at least of the policing policy, to what they wanted to, to call a new human rights compliant um, strategy, right? So, what do we mean by a human rights compliance strategy for policing? Well, basically, it was a policing strategy that sought to be based on dialogue, communication, and the commitment to this, okay? Facilitating peaceful protest, okay? So, it was a shift in, in um, ideology, in a sense, okay, towards facilitating peaceful protest. To help the police service adapt, they said, to the modern day demands of public order policing in a country that has a Human Rights Act, of course. Um, <clears throat> so, recent research then has seen a substantive shift since 2009 to this human rights-based model. 
And um, working with the criminologists, they basically said, well, you're starting to see a lot of uh, academic research that's saying, yes, this has happened. You have seen a shift, a change in attitudes. Okay? And yet, those that were looking at uh, the anti-fragging movement would disagree. So there was this um, interest in what's underneath the rhetoric and whether, in fact, the police were um, adopting a more human rights-based approach. Then there was this other strand okay, um, of academic scholarship that looked at what they called the security element of policing okay, in response to terrorist attacks and such. Um, and there was this notion in the literature that there were certain suspect populations that required more attention okay, for um, information gathering okay, um, and more attention when it comes to things like protests. So the concern in the anti-fracking movement is there's been a shift from what we've seen in the evidence to the anti-fracking movement now being considered to be a so-called suspect population. So that's where the sort of research um, kicked off in a sense. So what I'd like to do now before we get into the data that came out of the research project is look at some of the issues surrounding fracking and why people are protesting about it. Um, so I'll assume no sort of prior knowledge on this. So we'll go back to the beginning. So in effect, what you've had is uh, countries like Australia and the US have got mature, what we'd call mature fracking industries. Um, and there's been over the last 10 or so years more and more data coming out of those countries that's publicly available and people in countries like the UK that's got a, uh, a new industry are reading it. Okay? They're becoming more aware of the related issues. And consequently, what we've seen, and in a few slides time, I'll show you how it's shifted, that um, anti-fracking movement now is considered to be one of the, or if not the biggest growing social movement in the UK. So, um, we also have this other backdrop, okay? Um, the resource implications of what we would call extreme energy initiatives or uh, techniques, and climate change, okay? So, in other words, more and more people are now aware that keep it in the ground has to be a little bit more than just words, and that new exploration may not be the best thing to be doing at this point in time. And then you've got this other element, where the police responses to the anti-fracking protesters in particular have been seen to be deeply problematic. So you've got all of these, all this negativity in the mix. So that's the sort of backdrop to it. So in my early work on this, I worked with a couple of um, really interesting scientists, and we came up with this idea that extreme energy uh, or unconventional energy needs to be looked at as a process. And it's quite a simple process in the sense that it's fairly obvious that the rational thing for human beings to do is to just go for the easy stuff first. And historically, that's in effect what we've seen with energy production. Okay? Um, you go for the stuff that's easy to extract, has a massive return in terms of the energy you put into it compared to the energy you get out. And then over time, as that starts to run out, you go for the more difficult to extract. Okay, resources. And that's in effect the process of extreme energy. But for social scientists, one of the most important elements is this bit here. The process is driven by unsustainable energy consumption and it's important because extraction effort, that's the key, is strongly correlated with damage to both society and the environment. So however much energy it takes to get the stuff out, there's a strong correlation then with damage to both environment and society. So understood in this fashion, you can see the history of extreme energy in you know, gathering sea coal from British beaches, for example, as opposed to um, <clears throat> exploration underground, uh, natural oil sleeps, you know, getting the easy stuff first. Okay? And now we're in a world where you have deep water drilling, you've got the sort of poster child of extreme energy, which is the tar sands in, in Alberta, and if, if none of you have seen that, or if you haven't had a chance to look at it, there's amazing footage where you can see the tar sands um, from up on high in Alberta, and the images are quite astonishing, the sort of scale and the destruction to the environment that comes with uh, that particular extreme energy process. And then you've got fracking, okay? Um, so, one of the most important things to understand in this is this picture and how it changes. So, the energy return on energy invested is one of the least well discussed elements um, of this process where we get, we're looking at the more unconventional energy extraction techniques now. So the more you get about a red line, okay, in a growth-driven capitalist economy, the less we get to use for society. So it's vital to understand this picture 
because we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of capitalist society whereby you're looking at minimum 3% growth is what countries want. Well, basically, if you're spending more of your energy, your valuable energy, getting the stuff out of the ground, it means there's less for society to use. And you can see the bigger the red, the smaller the blue. And in the end, then, you're in a position where society is simply using a hell of a lot less, or has a less energy to use, because most of it is used in the extraction process itself. Now, um, there's lots of discussion about the most accurate figures, but in a ballpark sense, to compare something like the tar sands with conventional oil um, extraction. So in conventional oil extraction, one barrel of energy in would produce between something, something like 60 to 80 barrels of usable energy out. Now the tar sands, by some measures, is one to three or one to six. So it's grossly inefficient compared to conventional energy extraction. So in many respects, extreme energy has been called sort of scraping the bottom of the fossil fuel barrel. Okay, things are running out. And you can even get the, you know, the International Energy Agency saying this. It's just not, it's not made public in a, in, a, in a palatable fashion. But things are running out. The easier to extract stuff is running out. Now, whether you're at peak resources or not depends on your understanding of conventional or unconventional. I think most of the literature will now see we've reached peak conventional resources. We might not have reached peak overall resources. But what that means for society is that we can't hit the same growth targets because what we're dependent on is just less efficient. So <clears throat> that's a major, major issue, a uh, major element of the, to the background of the story. Now, this is a very simple picture, but even this has become intensely political. Okay, What you tend to see is when industry puts these pictures up, this line tends to be rather long, okay, and then when anti-frackers put it up, it tends to be a bit shorter, okay, largely because what people tend to be worried about is what happens with the groundwater, okay, so one of the dangers is that these fissures here can allow um, some of the uh, pollutants that pass the fracking fluid to, you know, reach the groundwater, but actually the data suggests that this is the most important bit how uh, the well integrity is maintained over time. So one of the most important things to worry about when earthquakes is not really what it does to houses and things on the surface, it's what it does to the well casing. So if this cracks, then the groundwater is much more easily contaminated. Um, so water is a huge issue. We've just written a paper on the human right to water and looking at um, water as a resource. So in other words, this very heavily intensive water industry means that um, local environments will have less water to use, right? So you're plowing water into this industry, it means that in sort of water-stressed regions, it really is a very silly thing to be doing. Um, and in the UK, when Cordula just had its final given, uh, go ahead to go ahead and frack, at the same time in the summer, as a hose pipe bound in the same area. So what you're getting is a shift of the resource from society to industry. Okay, so water's an ele element of it too. So, um, why are people worried about it in the UK? Well, the sort of data that you get from the US often involves pictures which are quite emotional and quite obviously demonstrating environmental destruction, okay? So, they're alarming. You've got documentaries. People are watching these things, people are reading it, people are getting informed and consequently becoming concerned. So, these are just some photos from our partners who are working with, um, who work with us in the Extreme Energy Initiative. They're called the Frack Tracker Alliance from the US. They're um, a big data gathering organization. And one of the things that fracking does in particular when it clusters together is produce a larger environmental footprint. Okay? Um, there's plenty of images of Texas in particular where you can see frack pags clustered in this fashion. Um, if they are to extract what they'd like to extract in the UK, it may be that you'd look at a picture similar to this if it were possible in a, as densely a populated air, um, island like the UK. So that's another big if. But people are worried about regulation and the fact that there's no current regulation which gives proximity um, distances, uh, limits, should I say, between human habitation and well sites, okay? In parts of the US, they don't have that either. Um, these are some photos from in the US, which have particularly alarmed people. So you've got a wastewater pad uh, there, literally within throwing distance of someone's house. Um, again, these are, aren't um, that exceptional. 
Then you get the corporate social responsibility side of it, where if it's near a school or something like that, the company will say, well, actually, we'll build you a new playground in compensation for having a frat pad within the um, school grounds. Um, it's had a big impact on farming. There's a number of scientific papers that have looked at the impact on cows in particular. The data is out there, and people are looking at it. So in short, the horror stories that you see coming out of the US and Australia are having an impact on people's attitudes in the UK. Um, another major, major issue, which again gets people worried about the sort of state of the roads in the UK compared to some places like uh, Australia and the US where there's a bit more space, is on average, if the infrastructure and the pipes aren't there, each frack will take about 4,000 truck journeys. Okay. Um, for wastewater and to bring water in, and that means, you know, grossly um, increased traffic. Um, and also then you get greater chances of spills and crashes and all the other stuff that comes with it. So in many ways, what we've looked at when we've looked at sort of the lived experience of people in the US and Australia around this, a lot of the time they're not really worried so much about what goes under, on underground, because what goes on on the surface is so obviously impacting on their lives especially things like road traffic. And um, near where I live in Surrey, we've got um, a couple of, of current applications that have um, tra traffic or sort of what they call data, sorry, um, traffic management plans trying to cope with the fact that they are single track roads. So you'll have lorries like this trying to drive up a single track road. At the moment, you've got two cars, can't even do it. So it's huge issues like that are getting people seriously concerned. So um, they haven't done an updated one, but Frack Off, the network that um, helps coordinate a lot of the anti-fracking activity, produced this map in 2013, which demonstrated <coughs> the current level of activity with anti-fracking groups. And then within a year, you had that. And then since then, we're now looking at about 300 anti-fracking groups that are all very active. Um, so. I think it's fair to say it is the biggest social movement, growing social movement in the UK, um, and they're very, very well informed. And consequently, then, going back to this study, um, in many respects, that's why the protests around this particular area, the Barton Moss campaign, um, were so controversial, because the police were having to deal with numbers they hadn't dealt with um, for some time, and they were dealing with something which had a lot of public sympathy. So... Um, the year after, the police decided to produce a national strategy to cope with this new issue of protests around um, anti-fracking. So what they wanted was a consistent approach to the policing of onshore oil and gas operations. Um, and this particular document provides an insight into the public order policing policy in the UK and the police's strategy. And in particular, what's really interesting from a criminology point of view and uh, social scientists more generally, is they outlined what they considered to be a structure of protest. So they analysed the way in which people were organising, the type of people they put into categories um, in order to um, demonstrate at what point they need uh, a higher level of policing, etc. So in the next slide, we'll see their structure of protest. And uh, they were interested in the basic positioning, they said, of individuals within protest and the levels of actions attributable to each category. So they came up with categories and then they came up with ideas about what each category of protester would engage with. So we'll see here um, the diagram. So I'll let you digest that for a second. So what is it to be an activist? So basically you have a sense of activism equal, equal in criminality, okay? Um, and this is in, you know, uh, an official document that's basically meant to be guiding uh, police's attitudes towards policing of onshore oil and gas. So this is the structural protest that the police have been told to, um, to deal with. And then you've got here. So the dotted line is the line of criminality. So have a read of that. definition of activist probably include all of my students <laughs> if I'm lucky okay so you know from a human rights perspective that's deeply worrying okay for the police to be instructed in that sense 
The next element we've got, um, that we'll come to in a minute, is this notion that the suspect population I mentioned at the beginning are now being seen as, quote, domestic extremists. Okay, so it's a sort of new category. Um, amazingly, this label was given by the chair of the Committee on Climate Change. So anti-fracking protesters by the chair of the Committee of Climate Change are now seen as domestic extremists which is quite astonishing, but that person's obviously brought the argument um, which the industry likes to put forward, that it's a bridge fuel to a cleaner utopia at some <coughs> point. So, yes, it's obviously not as clean as it could be, but it'll help get us to a carbon-neutral economy is the, sort of the argument they put forward. So he was obviously persuaded by that. So they're now seen by some as um, domestic extremists, and plenty of the data we've seen has highlighted this sort of attitude amongst the police officers. Now, I presume most of you will have heard of the prevent strategy, okay? Um, <clears throat> the government's um, counter-terrorism strategy, where, you know, uh, people like myself have to report on worrisome tendencies we may see in our student cohort. Um, the prevent strategy um, has led to <clears throat> qualified officers going around the country and trying to educate people about what we need to look for and what we need to be worried about. And this was leaked from a sixth form college, okay? <coughs> School in the UK. So, this is a quotation from the person that was giving the um, instruction, the tuition. At present, the person said, the greatest resource we have is devoted to pre uh, preventing people from joining or supporting the so-called Islamic State group, its affiliates and uh, related groups. More locally, East Riding's main priorities are far-right extremism, animal rights, whatever he means by that, and anti-fracking. So, ISIS... Animal rights and anti-fracking are all lumped into the same category. I mean, what does he even mean by animal rights? Not like animal rights protesters, just animal rights. It doesn't even make sense. But this is the sort of stuff that you're getting now, um, and it's, it's absolutely incredible. So, and it's just one example, that there'll be plenty more, I'm afraid. Um, so the key national findings we've got so far, so we've looked at um, the data from the Barton Moss and our, my, my, my wonderful colleagues that produced that report, um, said, look, we'll use this as a model and we'll see what other aspects are evident around the UK. So we're building up slowly a national picture. We'll hopefully have a report out after Christmas. But most of the activities are still in the north of England, okay? The south of England, um, in the sort of Tory heartland, still has some activities, just not on the same scale, okay, uh, as the north of England. But basically the protests <coughs> are overwhelmingly peaceful, but they are very disruptive, okay? to the corporate activities. That is their point, okay? By design, that's what they're looking to do. The nature and scale of the policing operations has, however, had the effect of undermining, not facilitating, which was their policy shift, apparently, but basically we've seen that it's undermining uh, the right to peacefully protest. The communication strategies focus primarily on justifying the policing operation, and questioning the legitimacy of the protest, okay? So the domestic extremism bit fits into an undermining of the legitimacy of the protest in many respects, okay? Um, and this has come out of a lot of the interviews. One of the other elements that's meant to be part of a human rights-based approach is this effective dialogue between the police and the protesters. But there's so much distrust between them the effective dialogue is uh, just simply not happening. We've got plenty of people who are complaining about... Um, the surveillance, okay? Um, there's a lot of collusion between private security firms and the police to um, share surveillance information with the corporations. It's becoming a very, very murky area, unfortunately. Um, these police liaison officers are meant to be those that facilitate the communication. But from the interviews, there's a deep distrust of them, and actually they're seen more as intelligence gatherers. Okay, um, the PLOs are a bit of a misnomer to me, said one uh, respondent, a bit of a non-starter. They have preset limits as to where they can let the perceptions go. They have to keep up the company line. We're facilitating a peaceful protest, even when evidently they aren't. <clears throat> I'll read out some, some um, example uh, quotations. So for a long period after we arrived, we had something like nearly three weeks where the only form of protest available to us was to stand by the side of the road, sometimes waving a placard, more often by being pinned up against a hedge with two, three, four, probably containment, either two or three, four policemen holding them against the hedge or an individual officer physically restraining that person. 
So it was very repressive. Another one said, I find myself thinking, well, okay, our lawful right to protest is not being facilitated, it's being suppressed. I have to think about protesting probably in some more radical fashion. I'm up to the stage where I would be happy to engage in some form of what could be termed direct action. I'd be quite happy and confident that I could go then before a judge, present to him a case that convinced him that I was left with no other choice. So people were feeling that they had to do something more radical. So perversely, in many respects, it might have been encouraging more radical um, direct action. But more, perhaps one of the most worrying elements was not that they were just um, failing to facilitate protests, but actually a lot of their police behaviour was quite violent. Um, there was violent behaviour and harassment reported. Um, these were central features across all of the interview sites. Okay, these weren't uh, rare occurrences. All sites reported violent police behaviour. Um, another quote. One day we could actually just peacefully and calmly be walking down the road and be allowed to walk down the road. Other times we'd just be shoved, pushed, beaten, and we just never know what kind of day it was going to be. Partly because they didn't have a relationship with the officers, they would change, officers would come in from other locations. But basically there was um, an experience across every single site that we studied of violence. And then there was also this sort of sexualized violence too, and the Barton Moss report um, highlighted this, and we, we're also seeing this across other sites as well, uh, where women were targeted by um, male police officers. Um, and I'll read out another quote. Uh, a lot of the time it is women on the front line, but not only that, we've noticed officers specifically target women for violence. They've inappropriately touched them, groped them. I've been inappropriately touched. Every single woman on the front line has had some kind of inappropriate physical contact with an officer. Sometimes their hands will just go up way too high. Somebody had their breast groped, for example. And this isn't just one. We've seen this across all of the sites. It's another deeply <coughs> worrying element of the, um, of the policing. And then looking more broadly at, you know, why is this happening? What's the point? Well, the overwhelming majority, 98% of arrests, are for non violent offences. Okay, that's a very important element to understand. And then this. Two-thirds of the cases were dropped, dismissed, or people were found not guilty. Two-thirds of arrested protesters whose cases have been concluded had their cases dropped, dismissed, or been found not guilty by the courts. The ultimate outcome, um, you'd have thought, would be a very, very bad um, set of figures for the police. So is it about securing convictions or is it about something else? Now, given the low conviction rates, arrests don't appear to be carried out with a view to securing convictions. Okay? If they were, they'd, they'd want a much higher level of evidence, for example, and a much more likely um, chance of success. So what is it about? Now, that we've basically come to the conclusion the behaviour of the officers policing anti-fracking protests across the UK currently has the effect of prioritising commercial interests over the right of local interests and supporters to exercise their rights to protest. So the question we led with, is this the sole intention? Is this the main intention of the policing strategy? Okay? Um, and it's an important question given the figures. Now... To contextualise this with some theoretical insights from other, from other contexts to try and explain the trajectory of the policing and the government's attitude towards the industry and towards people who don't like it and don't want it, um, we can draw now on a small body of literature, but some that have come up with very important insights. So in the Australian context, um, uh, Kim de Rieck, who writes very interesting work, has made this argument, and, and I tend to uh, concur. The extraordinary expansion, he said, of the unconventional gas industry has led to questions about social power and the rights of individuals and local communities, the role of multinational corporations in politics and rural service provision. And this, very important, the close relationship between governments and powerful multinational corporations brings to the fore, he said, questions about political influence and human rights. Now, when I read this at the beginning of our sort of research, I thought, well, you know, I'm seeing a lot of this already. Now, one of our wonderful environmental consultants put together this picture for us after years of meticulous <coughs> research. Deeply, deeply concerned. This was during the time of the coalition government um, that started the austerity programme. Now, um, he's since done an update, which is just too big, too complicated to get on one slide, but highlights even more worrying connections. 
Now, there's lots of worrying connections here that demonstrate business, uh, corporate influence over government. But the most concerning, given the topic I'm talking about now, is that one at the top here. So, Lord Brown was the lead, unelected, okay, uh, non-executive director in the Cabinet Office. So every single energy meeting, he would be invited directly into the Cabinet, the heart of government, to advise on energy policy. While simultaneously being, you can see that black line go into the blue square? Simultaneously being the chairman of the UK's main fracking company. Now, I'd say if this was like a developing country, it'd be called what it is, <laughs> quite possibly. The UK, we don't use the word corruption. It's influence. <laughs> but, you know, this is meant to be a democratic, unbiased decision-making process. The heart of government. Okay, and this person's allowed to be in minimally a conflict of interest position. Uh, and it's, it's not really uh, controversial, and obviously it really should be. So there's a systemic issue here. And then you've got not just this close relationship, but a lack of empowerment in the community. So in, in Lancashire in particular, where the local council was convinced by the evidence they heard, and I gave evidence at Lancashire along with a number of other people about the potential impacts of it, and ultimately the county council rejected uh, the applications, but the government through its own um, shift in policy to allow them to overrule such decisions overruled it and you now have local democracy being overruled by central government um, decision making so there's a feeling of disempowerment and then when you see those sort of political connections the local populations are becoming more and more worried so okay they're also worried about a lack of evidence-based policy they're worried about a misinformation about the hard sell of the industry without an appreciation of the negative impacts and they're very worried about the proximity and the manner in which the Department of Energy and Climate Change works with industry. Okay? So you could say that's just business working with government. Okay? Or you could look at it as a bit more concerning. So the Guardian, along with Greenpeace, did a couple of freedom of information requests, which really highlights that notion that Kinder Reed came up with, the close relationship between government and industry. And they make for fascinating and somewhat extraordinary reading. Um, one of the most important things that came out of uh, this exposure of, of email exchanges was that what Noam Chomsky would call the manufacturing of consent was overtly in evidence. Managing national attitudes was something the government and the industry worked together on. So... <clears throat> Could you imagine the Department of Energy and Climate Change having such cosy email exchanges with Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace as this? I'll let you read that for a second. It's just worth appreciating the tone and nature of the correspondence. Okay, so these are all the big players in the unconventional energy field. Okay, um, and there are probably about 50 of these types of emails. And then the next one, which is really extraordinary. So, you're going to have the next day a report from Public Health England released which did not paint fracking in a particularly favourable light. So the government and the industry quickly got together and agreed lines to take. What's that, propaganda, PR? Okay, so basically agreeing, this is what we'll say. The report is welcome and we consider its findings. We're confident there's robust and appropriate regulation in the UK, blah, blah, blah. And look at this. Also here are the details of our press officer. So the government's offering their own press officer to be used by the corporation, okay, to spin out this line. You know, that's more than just close relationships. That's working together to manipulate the public perception it's quite astonishing. So it was, it was, it was fantastic. And you can, I think you can still find all of the emails on, on the Guardian's website, but it was from a freedom of information request. But anyway, it just highlights that, you know, those close relationships are there. And it's no longer really a sort of open, uh, sort of revolving doors, they call it. I think it's more of an open corridor between industry and, um, and government. So, uh, to bring you up to date a bit, um, the sort of recent developments we've seen, which add another layer to this, 
Um, I don't know if any of you have seen in the, in the, in the press so, um, about a month or so ago, um, we had the first um, three environmental protesters to be jailed since 1932. Okay, they were, they were basically um, lorry surfing. It's one of the direct action techniques to slow down the lorries going into the site. So they stand on them to make it more difficult to go fast without causing them serious injury. Um, and they were sentenced to 16 months in prison. 15 months and then a 12 month suspended sentence. But there was considerable uproar when it was discovered not only were these particularly harsh sentences for you know, um, a simple environmental protest, but also um, there was concern that the judge in charge of the case had family with uh, connections in the oil and gas industry. So there was a concern that he had a conflict of interest. But ultimately, very quickly, the um, decision was overturned on appeal and the Lord Chief Justice said, we have concluded that an immediate custodial sentence in the case of these defendants was, a strong language, manifestly excessive. Okay, so in a sense, sense prevailed, but the ordeal these people went through for a peaceful protest was quite astonishing. And then we come to the other major, major issue, a uh, relatively new development, the use of injunctions. So traditionally, uh, injunctions tend to name people to stop them from doing something. And here you've got this new notion, or relatively new notion, that persons unknown to can apply to anybody. Um, and these were the restrictive requirements of this INEOS injunction that was granted. And it's a long-standing one now. If you trespass on INEOS's land, unlawful interference with access. So basically, a lot of the direct action is about slowing down access to the site, okay, to make it more costly for them to do the fracking. So slowing it down um, is now seen as unlawful interference, obstruction of the highway, and they literally say it. This is the first time they've put that in writing. So they're naming forms of protest now. So these are now part of the injunction terrain in the UK. So they say slow walking. And pre previous to um, Bath and Moss, the police were tolerant of slow walking. The idea is that you know everyone's entitled to walk on the road. You don't have to walk at a certain speed on the road. You know, it's a public highway. So that was the sort of logic to that form of protest. But now it's becoming technically illegal in that sense. And it's seriously worrying people because, you know, if you breach the injunction, you could be in contempt of court, etc. And a lot of people are fearing um, for the consequences and whether they could be, in fact, imprisoned for contempt of court. And what's particularly concerning here is... Um, on a freedom of information request, it was divulged that in this particular instance, it was the police themselves that advised the company to take out the injunctions. So, quite the opposite to facilitating protest, they are making sure they are manipulating and massaging the circumstances such that protest is um, less likely. So it completely goes counter to the rhetoric that they were putting forward since the Ian Tomlinson death. So um, to just sort of sum up some of the, the conclusions we're making when we, when we release this report, these are our sort of tentative, um, fairly obvious conclusions. Um, so obviously we say that you know, these uh, rights to peaceful assembly and freedom of speech, which combine to form an effective right to protest, um, need to genuinely be facilitated by the police. The police are uh, conducting a review. Uh, we were meant to have done an interim report for them about four months ago, but it keeps being pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, so I'm now slightly concerned that it may never happen. Uh, it was just a tick box exercise, but we'll see. Um, so we would like a fully independent external review of the policing, and obviously we'll, we'll make all of our data available um, if such a review actually were to happen. Um, and this needs to be a fully independent process with a genuine police complaints because, you know, the numbers involved are, you know, considerable. So a lot of people are suffering from this. And then genuine transparency um, and a justification for some of the sources used. You know, why are they categorising people um, as activists, uh, as criminals, for example? And then desist from making those instructions to the corporations to encourage them to go for these injunctions. So they're fairly obvious... Um, pro-right-to-protest recommendations. 
Um, but if we don't get them, we'll end up with more of the same. Um, and as Anthony Ladd warns, we may end up in a situation where we're going to have lots of localised fracking wars, as he calls it. And what you're seeing there, that picture at the top, is particularly interesting because the police are acting as a sort of arrowhead to get the vehicles onto the sites. So it's facilitating the industry, okay, with, again, you know, basically government-funded police force, rather than facilitating the process uh, of protesting. So it's, it's considerably different to the, the rhetoric that the police have put out um, from what we've seen so far. So that's a basic summary of where we are with the research project at the moment. Um, I'm involved in another project which is looking at the social and environmental impacts um, across the UK. It's, uh, the government's put some money into the research councils to, to fund this. Um, social scientists had the smallest pot, as usual. Um, but um, we'll be, it'll be interesting to see after, I think it's two and a half years now, um, of what the other um, successful bids come up with. But the policing element, we will argue, is a major social impact because people are feeling they can't protest, and when they do protest, they get this sort of treatment. Okay, I'll finish there. Any questions? Cheers. that the government is so driven to this happening and it's publicly like uh, saying like this is a good thing and disregarding all arguments, science space or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, could you find or make, did you look at like what happened before or above the police department? Because it all like started with the, the guidelines, right? Yeah. Looking at the guidelines. So, well, do you know if there was like uh, somebody um, at central government maybe? That's the big question. the police? Is it possible to access that information? No, I don't think so. Um, and you're never likely to get people at that level to talk off the record. Yeah. So uh, you can just assume, but it may be a false assumption. It's hard to know how exactly it works. In my other fields, I've occasionally been lucky enough to... Uh, to have an off-the-record um, discussion with, you know, a state representative or something. In this field, the police won't talk, right? And and the politicians won't talk either. So at the moment, I can't answer the question. It's just guesswork. But you for know? instance, I'm sorry, but because I'm not from the UK and I don't understand uh, completely like how the legal system works, I'm from a civil law jurisdiction where every institution has a law that dictates what they can and what mm. they can't do and mm. how to exercise those powers. So here, it's, it's like the police can just like dictate guidelines, um, anything, and <coughs> like what? Like well, they have various um, structures within it, right? So, yeah. so those, let's go back to those slides. You've got like um, policy makers within the service. But what point um, they'll be doing the bidding of the government is a major, major issue. So you've got this you know, things like this, so national yeah. strategies, briefing papers, high-level policy discussions. But who then says, you know, who feeds into that? Yeah. You know, these are the questions it's very hard to get concrete answers to, right? Um, I'm sure there are answers. It's just a question of getting them, you know? Um, it's not easy. I think um, our collaborator on it is a, an NGO called NetPol that sort of monitors police behaviour. And... Um, they are our sort of go-to for questions like this, and, and they, they don't get, you know, access to question, to answers like that. It's very, very hard. Um, but you can make a relatively easy A to B equation with it. The government is driving it. It's got this sort of attitude. And then when you look at police behaviour, you know, and um, it's just so closely aligned, I don't think it's an unreasonable um, supposition that there is a strong steer. Perhaps a steer is the best word, you know? Hard to know, it's hard to know. But I mean, you know, talking to some of the police officers on the protest front lines, um, you may occasionally get someone that has an appreciation of climate science. By and large, the attitudes are that they're sort of hippies, you know, um, standing in the way of progress, et cetera, et cetera. It's not an easy one to answer, but you can just guess. Yeah. Um, two 
quick questions for you. The first one is, do you think that there would be um, scope for um, prosecution um, or a suit on the basis of ultra-virus behavior for overriding um, lo a local council's decision to reject mm -hmm. an application mm -hmm. to conduct fracking? And uh, the other question is, in terms of, um, you kind of explained a bit of this, like, obviously the negative social impact mm. of, um, of fracking and the associated mm. policing conduct, etc. Um, I'd really like for you to comment a little bit on potentially the positive social impact that's generated by creating all these grassroots movements of people mm. that are confronted mm. with a lot mm. of mechanisms that might mm. usually be quite invisible in our yeah. system. And yeah. if yeah. that can give us any kind of point. <laughs> well, I think on the, on the first point, um, I think perhaps, I mean, there's a number of us have sort of looked at um, what the next steps were legally because, you know, they, they feel, I mean, some of the communities like the Lancashire one feel that they've done everything they can do, right? The due process has been exhausted. But you've got um, more councils now as public authorities having to think about climate change commitments, legal commitments to reducing carbon emissions at the same time as being told under the national planning framework to prioritise development. So it's a clash, right? If that development itself is carbon intensive, you know, so I'm not sure where the best next legal step is actually. I mean, um, there's a guy I work with, um, Roger Cox from the Netherlands, who's made this argument that only the law can save us now. Revolution Justified was the book. And it was about using existing legal frameworks to do similar things to, to what you're suggesting, right? And I think perhaps that contradiction in the UK to on the one hand a legal commitment to reduce carbon emissions at the same time as promoting an industry that's carbon intensive may be a viable avenue. I'm not sure. I mean, um, I'm more of a socio-legal scholar, so I tend to go to my, my loyally friends for such questions. But they are, the next step is the big thing. Like what is the next legal step? Because the community is feeling that they've run out of legal options now. You know? It's a tough one. Um, what was your second question again? Oh, the positive side of it. The positive side of it I've seen is um, quickly summarised as there's a much greater environmental awareness now. And there's a much greater uh, desire to work together and to mobilise and to engage in, in publicly visible direct action and things like that. And I've seen, I mean, where I live is literally like the Tory heartland of the UK. And you're getting a lot of people now who are much more radical in their overall attitudes and they're looking at even their own consumption patterns, for example, as being driven by resources like oil and gas, etc. Uh, and it ensured a greater awareness of the problems we're all faced with. Sure. Sorry, what's the next one? Is it down the end? Yes, uh, um, a number of points. Uh, uh, given this kind of police surveillance uh, being so detailed that you kind of and given what we know about the Special Demonstration Squad and its mm. activities and after its disbandment, if you like, um, is there any kind of information that you've uncovered that suggests that they have, um, you know, a, a new equivalent of that that's actually in development, which they're keeping quiet about in, in any which way? And the, the second point would be that um, you mentioned this kind of prototype seemingly about how they explain the regulation and their kind of standards that they're committed to yeah. when they're faced with what is clear evidence to the conflict. It's kind of, it appears to be the case that this is a kind of government state line across the board. And we notice this in so many cases, mm. like the Khashoggi affair, you know, mm. whenever being interviewed on the uh, you know, the world of one, you will find government ministers, you know, defining the, the amount of standards that are in play, the highest standards in the world, and all the rest of it. And we know clearly something otherwise is taking place. So, given that fact, shouldn't we be focusing more really about the framework within which the media is outlaying this information? Because, after all, you know, if there's some kind of situation going on with national security, then you know, the secret mm. services will be informing us. How, how come the secret services don't get involved with this to allocate where the actual, you know, culpability lies? I mean, if a crime has been committed by a police officer, we're entitled to expect as members of the public that that crime should go through, you know, the normal sanction. So aren't we entitled to ask the our institutions, in particular the media, that they're perhaps not scrutinizing this in anything like the way it ought to be done? 
Uh, well, I'll start, I'll start with your first question. I mean, um, there are lots of people very, very worried about surveillance, right? A lot of fear about infiltration of the movement, which is partly why it's quite effective. It gets people to worry about their best friends in the movement, etc., distrust people. Um, and you've had, you know, we've got lots of um, interview data where people have explained that um, they, an independent journalist, some of them, so you talk about the media too, where they've gone, they've, they've watched a protest at a particularly controversial site, um, they haven't been arrested, they've gone home, and then they've had a visit, okay, from um, a relatively secret type of police unit, um, the names have changed and varied, um, but from memory, I think it was they had an extremism um, element to the title. But again, it changes. It's, it's a fairly murky affair, often connected to the Met, actually. Um, and the questions they've asked are like, "Why were you there? What were you doing?" And basically, they sort of like a trawl for information. But the, the question this person had in particular, I'm thinking of, is how on earth did they find my home address? Right, um, and there was a suggestion you get in a collusion between private security firms and the police to gather information, and the police are given the job to follow it up. Um, so there's that going on. There's what they call forward intelligence gathering units at the protests. Um, so no one's come up with any particularly uh, concrete description, but it's more of like a shadowy network type of feeling that people are getting. They, they all feel they monitor. They're all feeling very vulnerable about surveillance and monitoring. Um, and in some of the communities down south, we've had police go to visit landowners in advance to gather intelligence about whether the landowners would make their land available to protesters. So there's a big evidence-gathering trawl that goes on before new sites um, are granted planning permission and stuff. So uh, the short answer is I'm not certain, but there are strong suspicions of considerable levels of uh, intelligence gathering and surveillance, and how that data is used then is obviously problematic. On the media side of it, uh, the media in the UK on this topic is pretty useless. Um, the independent media is actually reasonably good. The best website for this is run by a single lady. It's called Drill or Drop. Um, uh, Ruth Hayhurst is an independent um, um, journalist. And social media is the, is the main avenue that people are getting around the apathy or the intentional disinterest of the mass media on this topic. And I mean, having researched it for a good few years now, when it is reported in the mass media, it's, it's miserably inaccurate. You know, it's not based on, on the huge amount of evidence. You know, they'll say things like, oh, it may cause earthquakes, but it does cause earthquake. Um, and they'll have language which is always quite equivocal. Um, they won't tell it like it is a lot of the time. And the data from the US and, and Australia is much, much stronger than you'll ever get relayed in the, in the mainstream media. But thankfully, one of the plus sides of the social media side of it is that you know, information is shared um, much more quickly and, and more effectively. The downside is this, a lot of the early surveillance goes on on social media. So one of the main issues with the injunctions was that um, the company were using Facebook to serve the injunctions, which is nuts. So they were basically just posting the injunction up and saying, look, you guys, everyone who's reading this is a person unknown. And, you know, whatever the legal likelihood of that working, it striked fear into people, you know, and it reduced quite quickly the levels of the sites that I was working on in, in Surrey and Sussex. You know, people were instantly worried, and the only people who were uh, less worried about it were those who've already so hardcore, they've already got rid of all their assets, and uh, they have them in, under different names and things like that. So there are people who try and take um, extreme measures, but that's not a significant number. So in effect, it's another way of reducing the protest. So the media's had a, a, a miserable record thus far, unfortunately. So there was one other question, was it, Renke? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was yep. going to ask that. Obviously, this has happened with other protests for other social injustices, mm -hmm. but the specific formalized structure, have you come across a lot of structures of protest for other types of like social movements besides specifically <coughs> the environment, like these formal graphs and tables of how to treat protesters? <coughs> This is really, I think this is pretty new in the UK. I mean, we've had some major ones in the past. In the 80s, we had, we had the, you know, the miners' strike. Um, we've had the motorway protests and things like that. And I think the police have sort of built on their experiences, but it, it's not been as 
um, structured and you haven't had specific training. And I think it's partly going back to what I said about it being the biggest social movement. I think it's seen now as like sort of the front line of protest policing across the whole UK, right? Um, and with environmental awareness growing, and with people, you know, gradually becoming more interested in actually thinking about what keep it in the ground really should mean. You know, not just words, but actually at some point we have to stop digging up more fossil fuels, right? And the thing with this is, um, it's so grossly inefficient compared to conventional energy. If we are to move to renewables, we need to be using the more efficient um, energy rather than this stuff. So the arguments about um, being a bridge fuel, for example, a lot of the local communities that I'm uh, talking to are all quite aware that that's just, um, you know, it's not a valid argument. So consequently, I think the increase in the local uh, resistance has meant the police have had to respond in some fashion. So I think this is more of a product of that. Uh, I'm not saying it's entirely unique. There's lots of similar tactics like the kettling, um, is still, you know, used. For example, um, people are, you know, seeing a lot of the um, the tactics that you've seen with much more violent protests. I suppose that's the big difference as well. They're being treated as if they're violent protesters a lot of the time, and actually the violence is coming more from the police side. So, um, and the moral dimension is also massively challenging, you know, because it's because people are talking about, you know, the ecological crisis and this. this <coughs> this industry's role in, in going in the wrong direction, in effect. So I think it's, it's, it's more of a challenge. Whereas things like the mining strike, I think, you know, the rhetoric from both sides was a little bit more even in terms of the morality of it. I think with this one, it's, it's a more difficult proposition. Um, I'm very neat, I, I don't even go to this university, um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> but I've kind of got what, another <coughs> question under which I've got two other questions. The big question is, why is this such a big deal? Um, the first, um, my two questions underneath that are, for the activists, why is this an issue of all the other environmental issues that are happening at the moment? Mm -hmm. Why is this something which has incented people so yeah. much to take action um, in the way that you've just yeah. demonstrated? And then the other part of why is it a big deal is what you're describing almost sounds like a, a huge conspiracy theory. It's, mm. it's, it's massive and it's got your government is involved. With that in relation to what you were saying earlier about the energy return on investment, mm. if fracking is so low mm. uh, or has such a poor return mm. on investment, why? What's the big deal with fracking? Yeah. Why? Do you, do you understand that? Yeah, question? yeah, absolutely. Really good questions. Um, well, to start with that one. Um, I think in many respects, right, it's, 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 the whole thing's not evidence-based, right? Um, so if I go back to this picture here, uh, a lot of those working on this issue from, um, where's my graph gone? There we go. Um, a lot of the people who are working with evidence, right, are basically saying the evidence doesn't work on any level. There are some who consider it to be like a Ponzi scheme. So basically the, the explanation to that question is these lobbying voices are sufficiently loud to make us ignore the evidence, including the, the energy return on energy invested, right? It's not a logical step. So um, it makes you, one, I mean, I'm not saying conspiracy, I think it's, I think it's instrumentally rational, right? It's, it's just, a, I mean, in my earlier work, when I worked on, on indigenous peoples, um, for example, in the, in the UN, um, the UK would constantly argue against um, the notion that groups should have rights, okay? Indigenous people should have rights to land. And they would make philosophical arguments about that. You know, rights of the individualistic idea, etc. So first of all, you've got to accept the fact that governments give two hoots about philosophy. You know, that's not obviously the reason. That's the argument they're using. And ultimately, someone off the record gave me an interview and they said, that's quite simply BP. Right? So basically, he was just saying the BP lobbyists were sufficiently loud in their ear compared to the indigenous caucus, that that's the one they listen to, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be particularly rational. It's about whose, whose voice is the loudest in terms of policy in that sense, right? Um, so there's that interpretation. I'm not saying I buy it 100%. It may be a bit more complicated than that. But in terms of the, um, the, background, the background energy arguments, the other thing I've been doing is reading these international energy reports. And one of the things that you'll see is the conventional reserves are dropping between 6 and 9% a year. So peak of the efficient stuff was reached some time ago. So in a growth-driven capitalist economy, that 6 to 9% has got to be made up just to reach zero. And where are you going to get it from? Right? 
So the other way of looking at it is um, the best stuff is now diminishing at such a rate that we have to replace it with something. And they're not currently replacing it with renewables to the level that is needed by a growth-driven economy. So it has to come from unconventional stuff. So on some economic level, there is sense being made of this poor energy return on energy invested because there are no alternatives or the alternatives are dropping at such a rate. So there's lots of elements to an interpretation that could give you an adequate answer. But I think that one's quite a persuasive one, you know, because the economy does simply require it, right? It requires it for the way in which we live. So, you know, it's a massive change. So even those who are um, aware of, you know, climate scientists and the need to keep it in the ground, the other massive crisis, to answer your other question about why this topic, is that on some levels people see it as tantamount to sprinting in the wrong direction, right? Okay? So they see it as so dangerous. A lot of these people that work in the anti-fracking movement came from the climate camp movement, right? So partly they're seeing it as pouring petrol on a fire, because it's so grossly inefficient. And the other thing that makes it so grossly inefficient is what they call fugitive emissions, is this expression we use in the US, which basically just means leaking pipes. And when they leak, they leak methane, which is you know, an exceptionally bad greenhouse gas. So the whole thing can get accelerated. So they're looking at this because it also has quite a big surface footprint. I mean, the tar sands in particular is, is, is with good reason, it's the poster child of extreme energy because it's so surface intensive and it can be seen from space. It's actually massive. And if you see the photographs, and some people call it Canada's Mordor, you know, it is, you know, it's an incredible, devastated environment. Um, <clears throat> so there's that argument for why people are so worried about it. But also you've got the other argument whereby you could look at it in terms of the global energy supply. And if we are running out at the extent that um, people like the people who run the carbon, um, the Post Carbon Institute, for example, and the International Energy Agency report suggest we are running out, what's happening in now is that people like in the UK are starting to see the necessary production coming home to roost in some way. It's no longer over there. Okay, it's now happening here, right, out of so called necessity. You know, um, so people are now seeing the environmental impact of an economy based on fossil fuel, non-renewable fossil fuels coming home to roost. So some people take that argument too, right? Um, you know, there's, there's an element in there. I can, I can sort of understand it, you know. Um, but I think it's a complex picture in short. And I think, um, but by, by and large, the most powerful bit is that people are now seeing this as the opposite of keeping it in the ground, in short. Um, well, they tend to say Russia, um, you know, less dependent on, even though most of our gas comes from Norway. Um, but there's lots of sort of misinformation about it. But if you look at, if you look, even if you just go on BP's website, say, what's the energy mix in the UK? Most of our gas comes from Norway, right? Um, but they, they like us to get worried about Russia controlling our gas, etc. Um, you know, but <laughs> you, I, think, I don't think you can look at sort of... Um, borders like that the point is the whole globe is in you know climate breakdown mode and um you have to look in terms of the efficiency more right rather than who's got it and who's controls it the most important thing is is looking at how efficient it is so if we have to move to you know you're talking about 20 odd years to go to complete decarbonization on this current model we've got absolutely no chance of doing that if you add unconventionals in the mix too I mean, um, we've, to reach decarbonisation, we have to be reducing our carbon emissions between 6 to 9% every year. At the moment, they're creeping up. You know, it's just an incredible ask, right? So if you add this into the mix as well, it doesn't matter where it's coming from. The point is it's replacing uh, a more efficient method, i.e. the existing reserves we do have, with less efficient stuff. You know, um, and you're also carving up local environments arguably unnecessarily. So those climate scientists who are very um, outspoken in their disagreement with this pathway say that the remaining reserves we're allowed to burn, we should be using to make the renewables we need. Because, you know, solar panels don't make themselves. They need oil and gas and everything else. So the climate scientists are very strong in making those statements. You know, um, Kevin Anderson's probably one of the best um, to, to read on this topic, and he makes that very strong argument, you know. We've got a very small amount of time in which to try and save us from runaway climate change, and we should be using the most efficient stuff, 
wherever it comes from, uh, comes from, and the government should be working together to ensure that that's what it's used for. You know, um, the other massive concern is uh, at the moment a lot of the gas produced by fracking in the U.S. isn't used for the energy supply. Um, the Food and Water Watch Europe have just discovered this um, in a recent report. It's used to make plastic. Obviously, as we all know, you know, we've probably got enough plastic. Um, so there's lots of elements underneath it, uh, and that goes back to that question. The other reason people are so worried about it is, you know, it's it's not often being used for that which we're told it would be used. Do you know which country the, uh, the U.S. I'm not sure exactly about the US figures. I mean, um, it, it should be simply a question of a, a quick email to some of our collaborators. The Frack Tracker Alliance in the US monitor these sorts of things. Um, I'm not 100% sure with the, with the US. I mean, it has used a lot of its own fracking um, for energy as well as plastic, I know that, but it's not had a very big impact on prices. The other argument we're told about the UK is it'll make gas prices lower. There's no evidence for that based on the US. And also in the UK, it just goes to um, a general gas market. Anyway, it's, it's not like, you know, you produce gas in Lancashire and everyone's local homes will be powered by this. It doesn't work like that. But that's the imagery we're told, you know. Um, and the environmental arguments the, the gas companies try and use as well is sort of akin to that of growing an organic carrot. So it's, it's local, it's homegrown. You, know, uh, you, you get that all the time. So it's, it's bound to be better environmentally because it's produced there. You know, um, and that's ignoring the energy return on energy invested argument. You know, intentionally ignoring it. But there's lots of sort of spin and misinformation, I'm afraid. It's not an easy thing. Yep. Um, so, uh, is there any? Um, I, I'm not. I'm not. I have just started looking at law at night. I'm in the development, but is there any scope for? Uh, like, how, how does? Uh, corruption law work in the UK. Is there any scope for uh, any kind of like uh, application of like any kind of corruption laws against? There was, yeah. I mean, uh, um, there's malfeasance in public office. Is one of the main ones that people have been trying um, through fairly. Uh, what should we say? Um, publicity stunt oriented actions. It's the best way I can describe it. So this person that produced this diagram then went and did a bigger one and prove could prove categorically that a number of these government officials had lied in Parliament, okay? Um, and based on, they said, the connections with industry. And they could prove it and document it. But the only way they could get taken seriously was to go and try and uh, conduct a citizen's arrest of the Prime Minister at the time. So myself and a number of others went and filmed this happening. So the guy um, spent four <laughs> hours trying to get arrested on, on Downing Street, and he had two pockets with memory sticks full of data. And the idea was that you get arrested, and they they become evidence. So the court would have to go through the process of analysing the evidence. Um, so after four hours, he was eventually arrested. Um, so he wanted to affect the citizen's arrest. We kept saying this to the to the security uh, officers at the time, and ultimately he was arrested for public nuisance, I think. Um, and his data sticks were admitted as evidence. Um, and then within seven days, all the charges were dropped. So he tries to do it every year, um, and he just can't get the evidence taken seriously by those authorities that he would like to do it. But malfeasance in public office was, the, was what he was trying to get um, taken seriously by the court. So I don't know much about that. I haven't looked at it. I'm just looking at these connections personally. But it was an attempt. You can have a look at it on YouTube. Just have a look. It's quite an interesting attempt. Can the, can't uh, like an opposition party um, bring this up in Parliament? Well, I mean, at the moment, you've got the Labour Party who've now come out firmly against fracking, right? Since Jeremy Corbyn came in, they've said, we will not have, we will not allow it. So as far as they're concerned, they're just going to use it as an election booster. Um, there, there's one Green Party MP, isn't there? Caroline Lucas, was it? Caroline Lucas, mm. like that. Can't she... Um, I don't think. Well, I'm not sure they'll have been able to. They, they can tentatively suggest it. Um, what they've proven is lies in Parliament, right? It's just slightly different. Um, but I mean, you know, you can say tentatively suggest, but it's fairly overt. It's just permissible, right? Um, <laughs> it's accepted that this is, you know, 
the way it's done here. It's just not public knowledge in the same way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, you might know more about this than me. You could argue um, the use of the Human Rights Act in terms mm. of responsibility of, um, you know, breach of rights and freedoms through the Human Rights Act by public authorities. Mm. Because presumably, you know, you, you could kind of prove to an extent kind of, you know, irresponsible behavior in the same way that the judge who originally convicted yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. whatever they were called, the fracking three or whatever they went by. Um, was obviously, you know, they put that there was a conflict of interest. So yeah, it sort of was persuasive, wasn't it? I think he was mindful of that. Mm. I mean, yeah, they don't know where the next steps are going to be, right? So, I mean, all of these things are sort of on the table, and some of our students have helped um, do like a, a, a legal brief. Um, and the, the groups are all considering, but they're, they're all knackered. They, 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 they spent an awful lot of money. They had to crowdfund all the time. To even get to the judicial review, which they've done, was £10,000. You know, it's, it's a lot. And whilst there's a lot of positives that have come out of it, there's also um, uh, a sort of, as I said, described in the paper, like a collective trauma we're seeing now. I mean, a lot of people are really deeply traumatised by this process of constant resistance. Um, but, yeah, they're looking for the next legal idea, actually. Um, so, I mean, I think the Human Rights Act, whilst we still have it, um, you know, is a potential avenue. Um, but they always ask me, and at the moment I'm sort of, you know, um, I'm struggling with so many al elements of the research project. I'd like to have like a team of really good lawyers who are interested. So let me know if anyone is, because we need more lawyers interested in all of this, actually. And all you'll get is a couple of um, the law firms that do a little bit like Lee Day, for example, um, that sometimes chip in with, with people to go and talk to the planning council, uh, planning committees and things like that. But we really are some way behind where they were in the Netherlands with legal assistance. Okay, mm -hmm. done. Oh, one, one more. I guess my other question would be considering, considering the political situation at the moment with Brexit looming over all of us, yeah. how is that going to change the approaches? Because as I understand it, the UK doesn't have its own Human Rights Act, does it? It's dependent on the EU. Well, it does have its own one, um, which came from the EU, but I think um, it, has, it has a relationship with it, but I think it's still technically independent, it's still ours. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be the big question. So, I mean, I know, I know um, Labour's argument is that that's one of, the, one of their six tests that they've got for approving Brexit. It's just such a mess at the moment. Um, I think that the Human Rights Act side of it will be so far down their worry list um, that it'll take a while to sort it out, alongside environmental regulation. That's the other big thing, right? Is the environmental protections that we have at the EU level. You know, what's going to happen with those? Yeah. Just, just, just to the point of correction, the European Convention on Human Rights has got nothing to do with the EU. Nothing. Well, I have these questions that I don't know. Yes, but so. the, so we, <laughs> we have, we have a, a Human Rights Act. However, because the European Union has said that being party to the European Convention on Human Rights, they might decide not to um, basically do business with countries that didn't, didn't keep that legislation or didn't have mm. that level of human rights legislation. So technically, that could be kind of a loophole if we decided mm. to repeal the act separately. Mm. Then that could kind of, because we want to keep some trade relations with Europe, that could actually affect us. And that was it's not a bad question. Interesting, in terms of the human rights dimensions, um, one of the things that we did with the Lancashire hearings was make uh, a human rights-based argument. And, and I would say surprisingly, but a lot of the councillors were um, interested in that. Um, I thought there was probably a little bit of scepticism, but ultimately it was one of the many arguments they put forward um, that was persuasive to them at that level, that council level. But ultimately, when it came to the government appeal process, it was a sort of irrelevancy, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cheers. Thank you very much for this stimulating talk. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you.
next seminar is in two weeks, again on climate change, on small island states by Susie Allegre of the Island Rights Initiative, so very much related. Uh, it seems that most of you, as in the sign-up sheet didn't go around, we only use it to announce other seminars, whoever is interested in the future seminars, please yeah. sign up before you go. <coughs> Thank you.